part of this impressive conference on Italian Catholics. And this afternoon, I'd like to share with you some of the challenges involved in creating a permanent historical installation on Mother Cabrini for the National Shrine on Lakeview Avenue. Against incredible odds, last year, the Missionary Sisters of the Sacred Heart of Jesus reopened the beautiful chapel dedicated in Mother Cabrini's honor in 1955. Talk about keeping the faith. As the walls of Columbus Hospital came tumbling down more than a decade ago, the sisters made sure that the chapel remained intact. They invited me to create an exhibit that would tell the story of Francis Xavier Cabrini, the extraordinary woman who in 1946 became the first United States citizen canonized a saint. Honored by Pope Pius XII as the patroness of immigrants, Francis Cabrini was born in this elegant house on July 15, 1850, in a small village in northern Italy. Not surprisingly, it has become a place of pilgrimage for Catholics around the world. As legend has it, a flock of white doves appeared shortly before Francesca's birth, and the family regarded this as a good omen. They had cause to worry. The 13th child of Augustino and Stella Cabrini was so fragile that she was baptized on the same day as her birth. The blue-eyed, blonde Maria Francesca came of age at a time of great political and religious turmoil in Italy, and despite many obstacles, she never gave up hope of becoming a missionary to China, like the Jesuit St. Francis Xavier. This photo of Mother Cabrini was taken in 1880, shortly after she had founded the Institute of the Missionary Sisters of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. At a time when few women in Europe or the United States enjoyed positions of leadership, this portrait captured Frances Cabrini's determination to set a new course for herself and her small band of sisters. Mother Cabrini's blonde hair, parted in the middle, frames her face, and she is wearing a simple black dress with a bow. Strategically seated beneath the image of the Sacred Heart, the 30-year-old Frances Cabrini makes clear her fidelity to Jesus by wearing a cross around her neck and a rosary at her waist. One of the most cherished stories about Mother Cabrini is her meeting with Pope Leo XIII in 1888, in which he advised her to go west, not east, to care for fellow Italians living in the United States. Like so many depictions of Mother Cabrini, this idealized image already portrays her wearing a halo, a future sign of future sainthood. But the real Francis Cabrini was a more complex character than this painting suggests. Indeed, her letters revealed her to be a resourceful, pragmatic woman who understood the challenges she faced when she boarded the ship in 1889 that took her to the United States, symbolized here by the Statue of Liberty. Mother Cabrini may have altered her plans to become a missionary in China, but in her meeting with Pope Leo, she made it very clear that she and her sisters were resolved, quote, to grow in personal holiness and promote the glory of God in every part of the world, excluding no class of people, no corner of the earth, even the most distant, the most uncivilized. This map, prepared in 1929 in connection with efforts to beatify Mother Cabrini, charts the nearly 54,000 miles she traveled establishing 67 institutions on three continents before dying in Chicago in 1917. Pope Pius X, who knew her well, marveled that Mother Cabrini goes from Italy to America as I go from my room to the garden. Not only did she cross the Atlantic Ocean 23 times, but as the Italian phrase puts it, she also traveled by mule and on foot. In the United States alone, she established orphanages, schools, hospitals, and sanitariums in major American cities, including New York, Newark, Scranton, Chicago, New Orleans, Denver, Seattle, and Los Angeles. Cabrini's letters are filled with astute observations about the challenges facing the tidal wave of European immigrants seeking a new life in America. During her second trip to New York in 1890, for example, she lamented that there was no priest on board to say mass for the 700 Italians traveling third class. Here is a rare photo of Mother Cabrini and her sisters taken in New York.
York City shortly after their arrival in June 1889. While many know that she stood only five feet tall, Catholics are often surprised to learn that she had blonde hair and blue eyes. Reflecting stereotypes of the day, in 1889, the New York Sun characterized Mother Cabrini and the Missionary Sisters of the Sacred Heart as, quote, dark-featured women wearing peculiar veils who ventured without hesitation to visit skyscraping tenements in which hundreds of families are huddled together. They got the last part right. At a time when few women in Europe or America continued their education, Frances Cabrini was an experienced, certified teacher, something rarely mentioned in news accounts of her institutions. Although fluent in Italian and Spanish, like so many immigrants to America, she had to learn English. What is not well known is the extent to which Mother Cabrini attracted English-speaking sisters to her order. One of the most exciting discoveries I made while doing research involved the incorporation papers for 1903. Not only were two of the three sisters who signed the documents of Irish descent, but the word Italian does not appear at all. Visitors to the National Shrine are fascinated by the habit worn by Mother Cabrini that has been carefully preserved along with her shoes and galoshes. Interestingly, the silk veil with its distinctive checkered pattern was a powerful sign of adaptation. In order to be more like American women religious, Frances Cabrini and her sisters stopped wearing caps and instead adopted the veil, all the better to signal their religious commitment. What also became clear to me as I researched Mother Cabrini is that she did not see herself only as an Italian missionary. Indeed, in a letter published in the New World, the Chicago Catholic newspaper in 1899, Mother Cabrini made it clear that she and her sisters welcome all nationalities and are prepared to speak to each of them in their own tongue. Clearly, Mother Cabrini saw her mission as extending beyond national and ethnic boundaries. In Chicago, she and her sisters sought incorporation so that they could establish and maintain hospitals and training schools for nurses and care for orphans and poor children. And as census records make clear, by 1910, virtually all the missionary sisters of the Sacred Heart assigned to Chicago could speak, write, and read English. For many Chicagoans, their first encounter with Mother Cabrini and her missionary sisters of the Sacred Heart occurred in 1899 in Assumption Parish on the north side. Founded by Servite priests in 1874, this was the mother parish of Italians in the city, and the brick church on Illinois Street has been a landmark in Chicago since 1886. But more than a decade would pass before the parish school became a reality. Mother Cabrini not only believed that education was important, but she felt strongly that students deserved to be surrounded by beauty and refinement. Assumption School on Erie Street did not disappoint. In fact, it rivaled many of the city's public schools in terms of its architecture and was featured in the prominent journal Inland Architect. At the proverbial 11th hour, I was able to borrow this marvelous image of Assumption School from Father Conrad Borntrager, the Chicago archivist of the Servite province. The old adage that a picture is worth a thousand words took on new meaning after Paul Lane restored this rare photo. Suddenly, we could see the faces of all the children, their teachers, and the Servite priests of Assumption Parish, as well as the elegant design of the building created by architects Samuel Treat and Franz Foltz. To my mind, this image captures the excitement and the pride embodied in creating the first Italian Catholic parochial school in Chicago. Indeed, only after the photo was enlarged to six feet could we read the inscription chiseled in stone, Assumption School for the Italians. Sadly, the names of the young women standing in the windows have been lost to history, along with those of the young boys whose legs hang over the ledge and the lucky four in their perch near the stained glass window <laughs> over the entrance. <laughs> Imagine the loss of <laughs> Photos such as these challenge assumptions, no pun intended, about Italian immigrants. Widely portrayed in the daily press as threatening the fabric of urban life, these Italian-American students represented faith and hope in the future of the city itself. 
What makes the story of Mother Cabrini all the more remarkable is that she entered a Chicago that already supported a large network of Catholic churches, schools, hospitals, and orphanages. Having agreed to establish a hospital at the request of Archbishop James Quigley, she forged ahead in Lincoln Park, not worrying about competition from either the Sisters of Charity at St. Joseph Hospital or the Alexian Brothers. Then, as now, the neighborhood was among the city's finest, located in close proximity to Lake Michigan, and the park named in honor of President Abraham Lincoln. This colorful image of Columbus Hospital at Deming Place and Lakeview Avenue gives no hint to the difficulties Mother Cabrini encountered when she purchased the North Shore Hotel for $120,000 in 1903. The spacious sanitarium designed by John Walcott had been a showplace along the lakefront when it was constructed in 1890, but it had fallen into disrepair. Describing it as the ruins of Jerusalem, she successfully negotiated with lawyers and supervised tradesmen to complete the renovation in eight months' time. Along the way, Mother Cabrini had to overcome the objection of neighbors to a hospital so close to their fashionable homes and to quell dissent from Italian doctors outraged that she had chosen Dr. John B. Murphy, an acclaimed surgeon, as president of the medical staff. Among the stories cherished by Cabrini's colleagues was her insistence on measuring a parcel of land at 5 o'clock in the morning to make sure she wasn't being cheated. When dedication day for Columbus Hospital finally arrived in 1905, all was in readiness from the most modern equipment in the operating room to the statue of the Sacred Heart donated by the DePrado Company. In his dedication speech, Archbishop Quigley recalled that when Pope Leo XIII gave me an audience, one of the first things he did was to ask me if I knew Mother Cabrini. <laughs> For Catholics of a certain age, this iconic photo of Mother Cabrini occupied a place of honor in family homes throughout the United States, often next to Pope John XXIII and President John F. Kennedy. But if Mother Cabrini had had her way, the photo wouldn't exist. In 1905, she wrote that, due to the insistence of the doctors, I could not escape having my picture taken for the grand opening of Columbus Hospital. In great contrast to reformers such as Jane Addams, who consented to the use of their image as a way to promote the work of social settlements, Mother Cabrini shunned the camera. Happily, Chicago photographer August Duderstadt convinced her to sit for a formal portrait. Not surprisingly, the camera shy Cabrini expressed her hope that this is the last one I take during my lifetime. Although women religious such as Mother Cabrini were familiar figures in urban neighborhoods, their photographs rarely appeared in press coverage of the day. The result, sadly, is that they remain largely invisible in histories of the city they did so much to build. How, you may wonder, did Mother Cabrini succeed in staffing a large grammar school and creating Columbus Hospital? It's a question historians must ask about all the cities where the missionary sisters put down roots. Writing to her colleagues in Italy, she often recounted the difficulties she faced in obtaining sufficient resources and property, all the more challenging because English was her second language. Happily for us, in the exhibit in the National Shrine, Mother Cabrini left a very powerful clue among the books in her bedroom when she died in 1917. Diana Bernanke, a conservation specialist, called Chris Payne one day to say she had found Mother Cabrini's address book and did we want to take a look. This small black volume sent me down a very interesting path, reconstructing Mother Cabrini's network of benefactors. In the exhibit, you'll see 15 of her supporters, from bishops and archbishops across the nation to the apostolic delegate from the Vatican, and influential lay men and women. As a member of a transnational religious community devoted to serving the poor in body and spirit, Mother Cabrini looked beyond ethnic and religious boundaries. Always a bridge builder, she sought and received advice and support from influential businessmen such as Charles Karst. At a time when middle-class Protestant reformers such as Jane Addams would have nothing to do with anyone involved in the liquor business, Mother Cabrini did not hesitate to list the president of the Columbia Brewing Company in New Orleans in her address book. <laughs> Mother Cabrini's supporters included the daughters of her first benefactor in New York, the Countess Mary Reed de Cesnola. Mary's husband, Luigi, was the founding director of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. 
Mother Cabrini's address book also confirms that she quickly acclimated to Chicago, where Mr. J. Harahan provided complimentary railroad tickets. While we had no idea how old Mother Cabrini's address book was, this photo of lawyer Richard Ballinger helped narrow the dates. Ballinger, a Protestant and Republican, was mayor of Seattle from 1904 to 1906. That Mother Cabrini relied on his legal advice speaks volumes about her pragmatic approach to obtaining property, especially in states that were hostile to Catholics. On October 18, 1909, Francis Cabrini became a naturalized citizen of the United States, renouncing absolutely and forever all allegiance and fidelity to any foreign princes, potentate, state, or sovereignty, particularly Victor Emmanuel III, King of Italy. Thanks to this document, we know that Mother Cabrini's eyes were blue, and at the age of 59, her hair was still fine. Great care has been taken in the National Shrine to depict what Mother Cabrini's institutions in Chicago looked like at the time of her death in 1917. It comes as a surprise to visitors to learn that her attempts to establish a hospital for Italians on the near west side was met with great resistance. The neighborhood just south of Little Italy's Taylor Street recorded the highest number of tuberculosis cases in the city, and its infant mortality rate was a civic disgrace. Yet Mother Cabrini soon found herself embroiled in controversy when she purchased the childhood home of Dr. Andrew Garvey, a staff physician at Columbus Hospital. When the neighbors learned that the Garvey home on Lytle Street and two adjoining structures would soon welcome, without distinction, the sick poor who lived in the nearby Italian, Bohemian, Jewish, Greek, and Slovak slums, they tried to sabotage Mother Cabrini's plans. As one of her colleagues recalled, firemen from the local station phoned one bitterly cold night to say the water pipes had been cut and the Garvey house was flooded. After an attempt at arson, Mother Cabrini decided that the sooner the hospital opened, the better. Although she could not be present for the dedication in 1911, the Chicago Record Herald reported on the extensive renovation and commented favorably on the operating rooms equipped in thoroughly modern style. Although it was impossible to acquire vacant land in one of the most densely populated immigrant neighborhoods in Chicago, Mother Cabrini, ever the pragmatist, favored the hospital's site overlooking Vernon Park near Our Lady of Pompeii Church. Unlike her critics, she understood that working class patients would be able to walk to the hospital or take one of the three nearby streetcar lines. Over the years, generations of Chicagoans have cherished the opportunity to see the room in Columbus Hospital where Mother Cabrini spent so much time praying and working at her desk. Lovingly created in the National Shrine, this space remains a sacred site drawing visitors in the 21st century. If you look closely at the blot on Mother Cabrini's old, old desk, you'll see images of two of her patrons, the one on the right, Pope Pius X, and his successor, Benedict XV, visible at the left. As her colleagues recalled, she was tireless, and often in the evening, she would write until a late hour. While Mother Cabrini did travel extensively throughout the United States, Chicago became her central base of operations, and her death certificate on December 22, 1917, confirms that she died here at home in the city. News of her death traveled quickly throughout the world, especially to war-torn Europe, where the Missionary Sisters of the Sacred Heart of Jesus had opened their convents, schools, and other institutions to care for wounded soldiers in Italy, France, and England. Thousands of Chicagoans came to Deming Place and Lakeview Avenue to pay their last respects to the Italian missionary who had embraced the United States and its culture by becoming a citizen. According to one account, each went away with a flower as a relic. So many wanted to touch her habit that the sisters cut up an old one into small pieces. At the conclusion of a mass celebrated by Archbishop George Mundelein in 1917, a large cortege of automobiles accompanied Francis Cabrini's coffin to the railroad station for the final journey to West Park, New York. Sadly, none of the city's newspapers documented this event with photographs. Almost immediately, Mother Cabrini's bedroom became a place of pilgrimage and prayer for men and women who sought her intercession. They wanted to be close to the Italian immigrant who had made Chicago her home and who understood how the love of God can transform a soul. 
hailed by the Denver Catholic Register as one of the church's greatest women, tributes to Mother Cabrini poured in from newspapers and pulpits in Rome, Dublin, New York, New Orleans, Seattle, Los Angeles, and Scranton, and were collected and published in a memorial volume in 1919. Archbishop George Mundelein of Chicago had known and admired Mother Cabrini as a superb administrator during his years in Brooklyn, and it is no coincidence that he began the process for her beatification in 1928. But if you look closely at this document, you'll see that tensions existed about claiming her. In this version, which I found in the archives of Cabrini College in Radnor, Pennsylvania, the missionary sisters of the Sacred Heart crossed out the address of the Chancery Office and put in that of Columbus Hospital. Not surprisingly, the official version published in the New World did not include 2548 North Lakeview Avenue. It is no exaggeration to say that George Mundelein, the first American Cardinal of the West in 1924, put the Catholic Church in Chicago on the map. Not only did he challenge Chicagoans to expand churches, schools, and charitable institutions, but his business skills were so widely admired that he was compared with J.P. Morgan of Wall Street. Thanks to Cardinal Mundelein's efforts, Chicago became the first diocese in the United States to host the 28th International Eucharistic Congress in 1926. The elaborate ceremonies held in Soldier Field, the city's newest venue, provided a much needed respite from news reports of machine gun gangland slayings during Prohibition. Regarded as a Catholic Daniel Burnham, Cardinal Mundelein made no little plans for the growth and development of the institutional church, and he was unwavering in his belief that Mother Cabrini deserved beatification. Chicago's Cardinal wasn't shy about advancing her to candidacy, and took seriously his role. After all, he claimed to have been the last person to whom Mother Cabrini spoke outside of the nuns of her own community. Not only was Cardinal Mundelein a confidant of President Franklin Delano Roosevelt and an ardent supporter of his New Deal, but in 1937, Chicago's Archbishop achieved international notoriety for a speech in which he denounced Adolf Hitler as an Austrian paper hanger and a poor one. While the beatification of Mother Cabrini on November 13, 1938 was cause for celebration, it bears repeating that it occurred at a time when the daily papers were filled with news of the depression in America and horrific stories of the Nazi persecution of Jews in Germany. Little wonder then that the American press and international news services gave extensive coverage to the solemn event at St. Peter's Basilica, recounting Mother Cabrini's life and work and the two miracles attributed to her. Chicago's Archbishop, pictured here, was the first American Cardinal to officiate at a beatification ceremony and the first to deliver a radio address from the Vatican. Indeed, the New York Times considered Mundelein's remarks so important that the newspaper published the entire text of his remarks. This marvelous photo depicts sisters and nurses in the chaplain at Cabrini Hospital on Lytle Street listening to Cardinal Mundelein's radio address from the Vatican. It was a scene repeated in homes and convents and rectories throughout the United States. Cardinal Mundelein praised Mother Cabrini's apostolate to the poor as penetrating places where even the police were afraid to go. He also praised her for erecting fine institutions and paying for them, at the same time recruiting an army of 4,000 women under the banner of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Mundelein reminded his listeners that Frances Cabrini became an American citizen to further her work, to link her institutions more firmly to the country, to show Americans the opportunity for their children. Calling Mother Cabrini a national heroine for men and women alike, he admonished his listeners not to forget that peace has its heroes as well as war. While the process of beatification moved at record speed from 1928 to 1938, Chicagoans also began to claim Mother Cabrini in visible ways. In 1936, the city council voted to rename Ewing Street on the west side in her honor. Visible in the distance is Our Lady of Pompeii Church, located just north of the hospital Cabrini founded in 1911. Year by year, Mother Cabrini became a more familiar, beloved figure, and in 1942, the city of Chicago named the new public housing project at Chicago Avenue and Larrabee Streets in her honor. A moving force behind this honor was Father Luigi Giambastiani, 
the survey pastor of St. Philip and Eric Benici Church. In the 1940s, WPA muralist Robert Smith depicted Francis Cabrini as the saint among the skyscrapers, recalling her deep commitment to the urban poor. One of the most wonderful moments in doing research for the exhibit occurred when Sister Joaquina Costa opened a closet door to show me this portrait of Mother Cabrini. I took one look at the signature and knew its significance. A widely acclaimed artist, Sister Stenesia, had a studio on the campus of Longwood Academy on 95th Street, and her commissions included Mayor Edward Kelly, Governor Henry Horner, and George Cardinal Mondelein. She depicted Mother Cabrini was her favorite motto from Philippians 4.13, I can do all things in him that strengthens me. Although Francis Cabrini's advancement toward canonization was among the fastest in modern times, because of World War II, the ceremony did not take place until 1946. A war-torn world embraced her as a sign of unity, and the celebration of America's first citizen saint continued in cities across the United States. Evoking the pageantry of the Eucharistic Congress of 1926, Chicago Catholics organized a holy hour in Soldier Field that drew a crowd of 120,000 people. A 48-foot high painting of America's first saint dominated an altar constructed at the north end of the stadium. A highlight of the celebration was the living rosary formed by 200 young women from Chicago's Catholic high schools. And during benediction, the stadium echoed with the sound of voices singing O salutaris hostia, tantum ergo, and holy God, we praise thy name. Although Chicagoans had always regarded the room in which Mother Cabrini died as a sacred site, in the years following her canonization, larger and larger crowds of people sought her intercession. As often happens with landmarks, visitors took with them mementos, such as this postcard printed by the Kirk Tite Company. Little did we know just how important this postcard would be as we tried to document the evolution of Mother Cabrini's room over time. Thanks to the archivist for the company, we learned that the blue color scheme dated to 1946. And quickly, another sign of our popularity, in 1947, there was a full-length film produced by Clyde Elliott, uh, screened in theaters across the nation. I'd like to conclude this brief historical overview with what did indeed become a groundbreaking event the creation of the National Shrine of Francis Xavier Cabrini. Here to my mind is a classic example of women religious creating sacred space, putting their imprint on the urban landscape. Nearly 60 years ago, this was the scene as Mother Cabrini's successor, Mother Antonietta de la Casa, reached for the shovel held by Samuel Cardinal Stritch. As an historian of Chicago, I think the record is very clear that in building churches, Catholics also established a place for themselves in the city. Built with the nickels and dimes of the poor, these structures signal faith and hope in the future. It is cause for great celebration that the beautiful Romanesque sanctuary, designed by Chicago architect Leonard Gliato and dedicated in 1955, has taken on new life at a time when so many of the city's houses of worship have fallen to the wrecking ball. In reopening the National Shrine, the Missionary Sisters of the Sacred Heart continue to honor St. Cabrini's life and mission which were deeply entwined with her devotion to the Blessed Sacrament and the Eucharist. Now surrounded by high-rise condominiums, the Shrine Chapel welcomes pilgrims from around the world who join Chicagoans for Eucharistic adoration every Friday and for Mass on Saturday and Sunday, and for special con con concerts and events such as Mother Cabrini's feast day 